Man, you already know what it is. Jay Williams, let's live life, and we're back. When you think of prison, you think of jail, you think everybody's tough. Everybody's a savage. It's not the case. Some guys don't come in as savages, but leave out exactly that. There are guys all across the world that are scared to death. And they hurt other people because they're afraid of being hurt. What happens with those guys? The ones that are scared to fight. The ones that can't fight. The ones that get bullied and picked on. That one day say, I've had enough. Some of the most violent situations I've seen unfold. Come from the hands of a man that was scared. A scared man will hurt you. That is a known fact. The last thing you want to do is make somebody fear for their life and you're really not going to do anything. Or put your hands on somebody and then turn your back on them. Back somebody into a corner not knowing what they're capable of. Our number one instinct in situations like that is survival at all cost. If it means using a weapon, if it means biting, there are a whole lot of ways guys get their revenge and guys handle their beefs. You always got to remember when you're dealing with somebody that's scared, somebody that really don't want no pressure, somebody that you're applying pressure to, it's looking for a way to get away from you, get up out of it, or to eliminate you. It becomes a game of chess, not checkers. Don't be worried about what he's going to do in the next few minutes. Like chess, you better be worried about what his next few moves are. You better be looking down the line. Because what he does today might not matter. It might be what he does two, three days from now that checkmates you, that gets you out the picture. I have seen guys that I felt bad for, like legitly felt bad for. You could see they were scared. You could see this isn't what they wanted to do. They didn't want to be here. I mean, who does? But now somebody's trying to take it to a level of violence that this guy doesn't want to take it there. Back to that instinct of survival. You're going to do what you have to do. And that's what we're doing today. Scared and won't fight. Scared and don't fight. When the underdog wins. Scared guys that came out on top. Those are the shocking ones, to be honest. When you see somebody that's known for violence do something violent, it's not really shocking because it's like, well, I've seen that coming. But when you've seen somebody that's been, a, you know, been the victim time and time again become real, real violent and do something that you never thought the man had in him, those are the ones that shock you. When things go the complete opposite of what you thought was going to happen, those are the ones that shock you. At this point now, there's really not a lot that shocks me after everything I've seen and been through in life. But there were moments when I could still be shocked. And that's what I'm going to share with y'all today. You know how to seen it. You know how to lived it. So, let's relive it. Quick update on life. I now have a four-man crew. Hired a new dude on. I'm going to keep you surprised who it is. Y'all actually know the guy. He's another YouTuber. Good dude. Glad to have him on. He's a hard worker. In due time, I'll let y'all know who he is. I'll let y'all guess until then. The houses are rolling. This week and last week, I ain't gonna lie. I've done more work in probably the last month than I had in a long time. I've been playing the boss role. I'm responsible for making sure that each job is lined up, that the guys are paid, they have the things they need. I have to go back and do the punch list. I have a lot as the boss that falls on me because I'm the president, the vice president, CEO, the secretary, you know, the complaints department, quality control. I'm all that. So it's not just I sit back as a boss. Between last week 
up until today, we've demoed three different houses, all the cabinets, all the tile, all different flooring. We've set, I don't know how many tubs, redone plumbing in three different houses. Now the house we're on now, we have leveled out all the floors, set new tubs, done all the tile, done all the demo, and are now we're now in the process of painting. Finished up the drywall Monday. We have been busy, man. Between the four of us, we grind. Like Nipsey said, grinding all my life. Like we grind from the time we get here to the time we go home. And we get them done. Our turnaround on our turnaround rate on a house, and this is a two-story, three bedroom, two and a half bath house. Our turnaround time from beginning to end, completely gut them, is usually max. 45 days but we usually get them done in about 30 so i've been super crazy busy with work so for anybody wondering where's jay where's jay i'm out here doing what i'm supposed to be doing i'm not the youtuber that started youtubing got big on youtube and started getting paid and quit working and then one day youtube didn't work and was like oh my god what am i gonna do i'm not that guy i continue to get up and go to work every day i'm up before the sun comes up every day i come home when the sun's going down every day that's who I am. I understand that you're never rich in this lifetime. The stress had gotten to me. And that was because of somebody I had working with me, which is no longer in the picture. His everyday problems started to weigh heavy on me. And it really took a toll on me. Now that that's out of my life, I feel more like myself. I'm back to who I was. We still haven't heard anything about my niece. Detectives did call me. They don't know anything. I think they know, but they just, the law is the law. They can't go looking in people's houses and stuff unless they have search warrants. So, no, we haven't heard anything about my niece. Got a teacup Yorkie. We went and got a couple weeks back. People sold us this dog. This dog was three weeks old. Hours away from my house. We get hours away and they called talking about some. Hey, we think the puppy's too small. You need to bring it back. She drove over two hours to your house. Gave you the money like... Nah, we'll bottle feed his little ass. Name's Nico. Check out Nico. That dude is tiny. So, having Nico in the house is like having a newborn baby. He's got to be fed every two and a half hours. Now he's coming up on six weeks. Um, My little boy got six shots at the doctor yesterday. That was terrible. He stays fresh. Check my dude out. Yeah, that's Mr. Noah. He don't want no toys. Nah. He's all about his drip. Dude say, I stay splashed out, daddy. How you like my splash? He's got his own swag about him at four years old. And then last but not least, man, I got to say goodbye to an old friend. Unfortunately, we had a friend get killed last week. It's a sad, sad ending and situation 27 year old Madeline Hudson aka Maddie is a really good friend of the family man. Maddie actually dated one of my friends he's in jail so he had to get the news while in jail and that's how we met her she used to come over kick it at the house her and her man did we spent a lot of time with Maddie Maddie was good people he said she was 27 she went to a party last week and everybody's drinking. You got a whole bunch of different people there. And she gets to arguing with this girl. Girl starts running her mouth. Things are getting ready to get physical. Maddie ain't no punk. Like, she'll throw hands. Her and the girl was getting ready to rumble when a guy walked out the house and shot Maddie in the back four times. In an apartment complex called the Masonettes that I used to live in. I know exactly where she died at. And it's just sad for this to be her ending. At 27 years old, she was shot by a dude four times in her back. She died at the hospital. She didn't have a weapon. She hadn't, the fighting hadn't even started yet. The guy that shot her was a dude by the name of Zachary. He was 22 years old. Walked out and just, bum, 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 bum. Shot her in her back. 
and she fell over on the concrete. And I can't really get that image out of my head of the sweet girl laying there on the concrete with four bullet holes in her back. And now this dude's 22 years old that shot her and thrown his whole life away. And he's not the gangster type. This is a little weirdo looking white dude that when he gets to prison, oh man. Maddie was loved. A lot of people knew Maddie. So he's going to have to answer for what he did when he gets to prison. Maddie has spent a large portion of her life in the streets and dating street dudes. So guys are going to, uh, they're going to have their own form of justice once this dude gets to prison. So once again, man, rest in peace to Madeline Hudson, a.k.a. Maddie. My heart goes out to her family, her loved ones, all her friends. Rest in peace, man. Rest in peace. Gone but not forgotten and gone too soon. Let's get into today's stories. Salute, Maddie. So I'm going to start with giving you some of the benefits of a cell. And then some of the downsides of a cell. And then the same when it comes to a dorm. Now, cells are great for a lot of different reasons. The privacy... The fact that you can actually get some type of peace of mind without having people around you at all points in time. In a dorm, there is somebody always watching. There's somebody always awake. Somebody's always moving. You got to, you know, sleep one out open because if you've got any type of conflict with somebody, well, in a cell, the door locks at night. So you can actually go to sleep. And that door is very loud. So if it opens, before somebody can get in there to do something to you, you have time to get up, react, and get ready. So the privacy is a big thing. But the dorm, you don't have that time to react. Usually, by the time you realize somebody's down on you, it's too late. You've already been hurt. Privacy was a big thing when it came to the cell. Using the bathroom. You could use the bathroom, and you might have to use the bathroom in front of your cellmate. But it beats the dorm where you're sitting next to five other guys on toilets. Last place I was at, it was just a bunch of toilets side by side, and then urinal side by side. There was no partition. Nothing to separate you and the next man. That man could be 300 pounds, and half of his thigh be touching you. I didn't like the no privacy aspect of the dorm. Second thing I liked about a cell, you can put your stuff where you want to and don't have to really worry about it getting stolen unless somebody sneaks in your cell, gets your door open. It's a lot harder to do when you live in a cell. Opposed to a dorm where if you leave your headphones laying on your bed, your radio or your CD player laying on your bed, walk up there and get some water and come back, your stuff can be gone just like that. In the cell, you can slide your shoes, your boots, things like that, right underneath the edge of your bunk. In the dorm, huh, unless you're built like that, you better not leave them shoes sitting there, leave them boots sitting there. Dudes from other buildings come in and out of your building, sneaking in, trying to get things from guys. They can really quick just walk right by your bunk, don't even know who you are. So it don't matter if you're a gangster. They don't know that's your bed. Walk right by, reach down. Pick your stuff up and keep it moving. The fight aspect. If you're in a cell, you know your environment. You can get away with it. You can fight and the guards possibly not see it. That's another reason I like the cell. But at the same time, in that cell, there's nowhere to run. So if somebody gets to killing you or hurting you real bad, there's nowhere to escape. Where in a dorm, you could... Cut between these bunks, jump over bunks, start diving through bunks. And there's a guard always watching them. Guards can't see what happens in those cells. In a cell, you can hide things. As long as you hide them really good, they don't get discovered. You ain't got to worry about hiding it out there and somebody else finding it. That's a plus. But the downside of it being, if you get shook down and they find it in your cell, it's yours. You're going to the hole. In the dorm, we got what's called common area. So if I got a knife 
I got a tattoo equipment. There's a bunk next to me. Ain't got nobody living in it. I take it, put a magnet on it, stick it up underneath that locker. If they find it over there, can't charge me with it. You find it stuck to the bottom of my locker. You can't charge me with it. Any one of these guys in here could have set me up and put that there. So you can beat the charges in a dorm that you're not going to beat inside of a cell. There's so many gifts and curses when it comes to the cells and the dorms. With the dorm environment, everybody showers together. I'm talking especially in the summertime when sports are jumping, everybody's playing basketball, guys are running, working out. You know, playing softball. When we come in from rec, we come off the yard. Guys are running, trying to get in the shower. You're in a shower that's got five shower heads. Listen to me now. Five shower heads coming down off the ceiling. And there's ten people in the shower. You step in. We call it pick and roll. You step in, get your body wet. Step out the water and lather up. While the next man steps in and gets his body wet. He steps out to lather up, pick and roll. You step in, rinse off, get your towel, dry your face, get dressed, and roll out. Most places that have cells have single showers. Not all these places do. Most of the places I've been that had cells had single showers. An exception to like, you know, House of Corrections and places like that, older penitentiaries, older jails. House of Corrections was a jail. With... The cell, you know who belongs in there and who doesn't belong in there. Nobody's going to go in your cell that doesn't belong in your cell. And if you catch them in there, oh, it's it's on sight. They're in there stealing. You got no reason to be in my cell. With a dorm, people are disrespectful. Somebody might cut right by your bunk and where you live at. And there's nothing you can really do you know, about it except threatening. Hey, man, don't be in my area. Don't cut beside my bunk. Don't be cutting through the cut. But at the end of the day, there's not enough. You can't really predict where people move and where they go. You got guys sleeping on both sides of you in bunks on the bottom and on the top. So here you are in the middle. You're on the top bunk. You got a guy below you. Then you got a guy on your right below you, a guy on your left below you, a guy on the left up top, a guy on the right up top, guys in front of you. And as far as the road goes down, there's just men everywhere asleep. With the cell, you didn't have to worry about that. With the dorm, you might have five or six people in there that snore loud. I'm talking, wake up the dead. And you lay there at night like this. Like, I swear I'm going to smother him. I'm going to take a pillow, and I'm going to commit my first homicide. I'm going to smother him for snoring like that. It gets hard to sleep at times. Guys playing all night, running around, playing music, talking. Oh, in the back of the dorm, you might have five, six guys at a bunk. Just laughing and joking, listening to the music Friday night, drinking, doing whatever they do. It's going to keep you up. So now you've either got to figure out a way to go to sleep or go back there and straighten all those guys that are back there and put yourself in a situation. With the cell, when the lights go out, you still hear things. You can hear, you know, if somebody gets to fighting or a toilet flushing in the distance. But for the most part, once you go to sleep, the only thing you really hear is your cellmate breathing. And if he's a snore, somebody that snores a lot, oh, you can, hey, bro, you got to roll out. You taking my peace of mind. I can't sleep with you in here sounding like you're hibernating. You know what I mean? Sounding like you need a damn apnea monitor or an inhaler while you sleep. You got to go, man. I got to get him to sell me. Those are some of the ups and downs when it comes to cell life versus dorm life. Now that we've got that out the way, let's go ahead and jump in, too. When the underdog comes out on top. Eliminate your enemies at all costs. Messing with a scared guy. Oh, you thought because he was small and weak, you could bully him and take what you want. You were just going to take it, wasn't you? Oh, you were just going to take it. Thought you was going to do one of them things. Never thought he'd react the way he acted, huh? you got to remember, when it comes to war, there are no rules. Especially when it comes to a scared man. When it comes to a scared man in war, there are no rules. He's going to eliminate you at all costs. Find yourself locked up. You think you want to pick on somebody. Remember what I just said. That scared man will eliminate you at all costs. And there are no rules to fighting. And there are no rules to war. Let's get into it. 
Everybody starts off when you head to prison. Your journey starts the moment you're put in handcuffs, the moment you're caught for your crime, the moment you're arrested. You're then taken to jail, mug shotted, fingerprinted, given all your charges. You start going up for bail hearing. You start going in front of the judge. Eventually, you're found guilty or not. But if you're found guilty, you're going to be sentenced. From there, you go to prison. Out here, everybody hits what's called a receiving or a reception center. This is where they classify you due to your charges. Now, the crazy thing about receiving and reception centers is everybody starts off in one of these places. You could be in there for auto theft and be in the cell with a guy that's a serial killer. You could be in there for check fraud and be in a dorm with guys that are never going home, that are just coming in like you. Usually at this place, 30 days to 90 days. They're going to classify you due to your crime, and they're going to determine what level of prison you're going to. All right, this dude likes to steal. He's going to go to a level one, level two, maybe end up on it. Work camp somewhere where he goes out and works on the road every day. Okay, this guy's violent. No, we got to start him off at a level three, four, where people have life, where there's killers all around you. Everybody goes through receiving. One of the worst ass whoopings I've seen a dude get took place in receiving. And it sticks out to me because it was the very beginning of my bid. Now, there was so much stealing going on at this place, and this was a dorm environment. There was so much stealing going on that guys were writing their names on their personal property. Your personal property being something you bought through the commissary or through property. Guys would even write their initials on the stuff the state gave them. The shirts, the socks, the boxers. And dudes were doing that because there was so much stealing going on. I had seen dudes take the all-white Nikes. These things were like 80, 90 bucks from property. And write their name across the heel of it. Or their state number on the back of it. Or on the inside of it. That way if it gets stolen. Don't take a rocket scientist. To figure out who's got your stuff. They write it with a black permanent marker. It's not coming off. If you try to take that marker. And scribble over somebody's stuff. And then write your name somewhere else. When you walk by with the big scribble on your shoe. And then a new number written above it. To the guy that just got his stuff stolen. Hey, that's mine, man. You just marked my stuff out like we're third graders and I wouldn't notice. Guys were scary. So they were writing their name on everything. They would put their initials on everything they own next to their commissary because that was locked securely in a locker. But you might leave a shirt laying out and somebody just walk by and snatch it up. We had a dude named Ian Tigar. And they used to call him Tigger. I never called him Tigger. I just called him Ian. And there's a reason behind it. I seen a younger white dude one time scream out, Tigger, across the door trying to get dude's attention. And he ended up getting punched in his face because somebody thought he didn't say Tigger. Black dude was like, what did you just say? Y'all was calling Tigger. That ain't what you just said, man. Yes, I said, T bang, bang, bang. Punched him on his face thinking he said some racist stuff. In reality, he was just yelling out Tigger. So I just called dude Ian. I don't know if dude was Palestinian, Arabian, what he was, but he looked like he was some type of Indian descent. He was a young dude. He had a lot of money. His people had money. I'm not sure why Ian was in prison, but I'm sure it wasn't anything violent. If I had to guess, Ian was in there behind something stealing, something vandalism related, something stupid and that young dudes would do, right? The day Ian walked in, he had that same look that a whole lot of Guys, you don't have to be young. I've seen grown men with the same look on their face when they walk in. It's like that deer in headlights look. Or like you can just tell that this is their first go round. They've never walked into an environment like this. It's prison for the first time. They're scared. They're unsure. They know there's killers in here. There's all walks of life in here and every crime you can imaginable. Every crime you can imagine is right there beside you. Ian walks in with a bunch of new intakes. They put him in the back. That is not where you want to be if you are scared. In the very back of the dorm, it goes down. When we fight, we go to two places. The bathroom, because the door's shut. The guards can't see in there. It's like stall doors. They swing open like an old western bar. 
or you go to the very back of the dorm, which is out of sight of the cameras and it's out of sight of the control booth. And that's where dudes would fight. That's bad if you don't want to get down. If you're scared to get down, you don't want to be in the back. I like the back. I like the back wall because it would mean I wouldn't have to share a cut with nobody. Nobody sleeps next to me if there's a wall. So I got that little area to myself. They put in all the way in the back, which is also bad because stuff gets stolen back there. It's out of the camera view. The guards can't see. So if your stuff gets stolen, you can't go to the guard and be like, man, somebody stole my stuff. And they run the camera back and they're like, well, where you sleep is out of view, right? Ian hangs out with other dudes similar to himself. Guys that I would call more or less not built like that. Not about that life. Not violent dudes. They were the guys that were skittish and scared to say the least. Ian wrote his name on everything he owned. From his thermal shirts to his white tees, state issue blue shirts, blue jeans, state boots, tennis shoes, everything Ian had, had his name written on it, which for a lot of us, that was a sign of being scared. I didn't write my name on my stuff. I'm not going to steal my stuff. I'm not going to leave my stuff sitting out so it can be stolen. And if you do steal my stuff, enough people in here mess with me that it's going to get back to me who did it. And I'm going to handle that situation accordingly. Ian's got these fresh white Nikes that he wore all the time, but he kept them things clean. You'd see him sitting at his bunk with a toothbrush, cleaning any dirt off he got on him. Then he had another pair of shoes he wore to wreck. But anytime we would go to chow, we'd go to a visit, we'd be doing anything that wasn't, you know, dusty ass, wreck yard related, Ian would be wearing those shoes. We'd go all, all go out to wreck one day. We'd come in. I'd grab my stuff and I'd beeline for the shower. Already had my stuff ready, sitting in my locker. So when I came in, all I had to do was pull my lock off, reach and grab my stuff and grab my shower shoes and head to the shower. Well, while I'm in the shower, this bigger dude comes in the bathroom and I hear him telling Ian, come in the bathroom then, come in the bathroom then. Ian's not coming in the bathroom. I'm in the shower, soaked up, so soap all over me. And I can hear this stuff taking place on the other side of this wall where this dude is at. I finish up washing up. I'm not going to stay in here with the stuff going down. I don't know what's happening. I need to get out the shower. Even though I'm not involved in it, violence is taking place around me. I need my shoes on. I need to be dressed because it can spill over to where I'm at real fast. I finish up showering. I come out and by now the big dude has come out the bathroom and Ian is going in between the, in the, between the bunks, going in circles and the dude is kind of pacing behind him. Ian had come in from wrecking and stuff got stolen. Somebody told Ian, dude took your stuff. Ian goes up to the man, says something to him about it, and the guy goes straight into defense mode. Oh, you calling me a thief? You calling me a liar? You think I took something from you? Come take it back. I got to take your shit. What, I look like a crackhead? I'm like a bum? I don't want your shit. Matter of fact, come see me in the bathroom. Ian's not trying to fight. Ian's scared to death. Meanwhile, this dude just can't get him in the bathroom, and Ian is running in between the bunks trying to get away from him. Dude yells out to his homeboys, hey, catch him. Ian runs through one of the aisles. He's pinned. He can't go anywhere. Big guy gets his hands on him. Beats Ian up pretty decent right in there in between the bunks, right? Pins him down. Punches him all in his face. Got him in the back of the pod. And it's just working him over decently. Beats this young dude up, right? Next few days, Ian can't go to chow. He's eating out of his locker. He's trying to avoid the cops, avoid the guards, not be seen. Because he's got these bruises, knots on his face. And if they see him, they're going to know he's been in an altercation. They're going to take him over to the hole. They're going to question him. And they're going to keep him back there until they figure out what happened. So he lays low until he heals up. Dude ain't said nothing to him. Dude's left him alone. Ian heals up and starts going back to the chow hall. And the very first time Ian makes his way over to the chow hall, he comes back. And his locker's been broken into. They used to take these locker doors. They do what we call Lamborghini doors. That's why you take the top of a locker door, like a school locker. You know how a school locker swings open? Our lockers are just like that. They would take the top, get their fingers in there, wedge something, and bend it all the way down. And then grab the bottom and lift and bend it all the way up until that door bent in half. Hence the name Lamborghini doors. Ian comes back from chow. All his commissary, all the little stuff he's done in order that belongs to him has now been stolen. He doesn't say a word about it. Looking around, 
like kind of glancing, trying to see if anybody makes eye contact with him. Don't nobody say nothing. Dudes come to Ian and tell him, the big dude took your stuff, you know, and the big dude come over here as soon as you left. We watched him go bend your doors in half and fold your stuff back in half and take it. Ian's telling him, man, I'm, I'm about to be shit from here anyway. I'm going off to prison. Like, a d dude's already messed Ian up. Ian's scared of him. Man, I'm not, I'm not messing with that dude, man. I don't want no problems. But people instigate the situation. Man, I heard, overheard Ian talking about you saying that you stole his stuff and they didn't add the part. They never do. They didn't add the part where Ian was super scared and didn't want no problems. Dude goes down there. Hey, you talking about me? You telling people I stole your stuff? You still calling me a thief? And here's the crazy thing. The dude did steal Ian's stuff both times. Took the sneakers, stole them, sold them to somebody in another building, collected the commissary. Went down there that day when they went to chow, stole his commissary, took it right down there and put it in his own locker. But he goes up to Ian, what's up, man? You still talking? You ain't learned from your last one. This is a young dude. Ian couldn't have been, he had to have been maybe 18, 19 at the oldest. Scary ass dude. Ian tells him, no, no, no. And he's sitting in the chair in between his, the bunks telling him, no, no, no. He should have got up immediately to be able to defend himself. But he's sitting there telling the dude, nah, man, I didn't say you did anything. A dude just open hand slaps Ian. Pow! One of them slaps once again that just leaves the handprint on the side of the face. One of those slaps that if you run into him two hours from now, did nobody even have to tell you he just got slapped. The slap is still on his face. You can see this dude's damn fingerprints on this dude's face. Like, if they were to come around with a little black thing and do fingerprint checks, his fingerprints all over this boy's face. He just slapped the shit out of Ian now, right? Ian goes to the counselor a couple of days later and is like, when am I going to be shipped? When are they going to send me off to the prison I'm going to be at? I don't want to be here no more. He can't tell the people what's going on because if he happens to come out the hole before he gets shipped to the next prison, now he's labeled a snitch. Counselor gives him no answers. I don't know when you're going to be shipped. When they call your name, you get on the bus and they take you to the next prison. I have no control over that. Can you try to rush it? I have no control over that. I don't do moves. They move you when they move you, right? Ian lays low. Not much more to be said. They're out there playing chess one night and you can order your own chess board, your own chess pieces because the ones that the prison provide most times didn't have all the chess or checker pieces in it. Guys would take those pieces, those little chess pieces, the plastic ones, and they would burn them. Collect the soot, mix it with alcohol, shampoo, different things to make ink. So if you find a chess set sitting out there Oh, that's going to be missing pawns, rooks, kings. Ian plays chess one night with some homeboys of his, the other little dudes that I still couldn't even really believe were hanging out with him because they were scary too. Goes on to bed and tells his homeboy, you know, I'll grab my chess set from you in the morning. Dudes and them finish playing chess and leave Ian's chess board sitting up there. Chess board gets stolen. This is all in a matter of two weeks. Ian is not having a good time in prison. Ian did not listen to the people in the streets that told him, keep your little dumb ass out of trouble. You're not going to like prison. Ian is a prime example of just did it my way like Frank Sinatra. The chessboard comes up missing, right? Dudes go around asking. It's common courtesy. Hey, anybody see a chessboard sitting up here? Dude that let me use the chessboard, man. I left it up here. Maybe somebody picked it up by accident, right? The big dude is looking over at Ian. I see Ian, he glances over at the big dude. Big dude's more or less looking for a reason to beat Ian up again, right? You can see that Ian is scared to death. He's untold what the dudes look, man. I don't even care about the chessboard. Leave it alone. Leave it alone, man. Like, I, I don't want no more problems. I'm not trying to get beat up again. Who cares? When the chessboard was like $8, I don't, I don't care. Leave it alone, right? Meanwhile, the big dude's still looking at him, and I'm guessing all he could think is, well, he thinks I stole his chessboard. You didn't steal it, but if you had an opportunity to, you would have. You're a thief. Ian is shook. Ian's thinking, great, now I'm going to get beat up again because something else of mine has got stolen. The big dude don't do nothing. For the next few days, Ian was real, real quiet. When I mean quiet, you ever seen somebody that was scared and they get quiet? There's a difference between just being quiet and staying to yourself and being scared, and that be the reason you're quiet. You can see the difference in a man. A man that's scared is like constantly on swivel, 
He's not real much in the conversation. He laughs when things aren't funny because he's nervous, right? Ian is convinced this big dude is going to beat him up again. The dude's made threats to him, made some threats within a few days. We go to sleep one night, and they used to leave these red lights on in the ceiling. They turned the bright white lights off, but there was a couple of red lights placed throughout that they would leave on at night so that it's not bright in there, but it illuminates it enough that if a guard is looking at the camera, the guard can see what's going on in there. If a guard was to come through there, say a female guard was to come through at night and be doing count or just doing you know, welfare checks on dudes, it's enough light in there that the other guards can see her and see if anything's transpiring. She's doing things she shouldn't or somebody's trying to hurt her. They would leave these red lights on. I'm dead sleep one night and I wake up to a, I'm going to kill you. This is what I hear. Somebody yell, I'm going to kill you. And then I hear a thud and another thud and another thud and a bunch of thuds. And then I start hearing people talk, people waking up. What the, like you start hearing the chaos take place around you because people are waking up to what's going on. He scared Ian. He was, Ian was more or less just waiting for this dude to physically harm him again. And I guess guys had told Ian, you need to get to him before he gets to you because it's going to happen again. He's done put hands on you twice. If you don't make an example out the man, it ain't going to be long before other guys start doing it to you as well. When you get down the road, when guys find out you're not going to defend yourself, you might have a lot more to worry about than just somebody beating you up or somebody slapping you. When you get up into them penitentiaries and them dudes are doing life, and here you are, this little frail dude, they might be doing more than just slapping you around. They might be slapping something else. For whatever reason, dudes gassed Ian up that you need to figure this out, man. You got to do something. Let dudes know you ain't a punk. That's why your stuff keeps getting taken. That's why you keep getting hands put on you because guys see you ain't going to do nothing. Ian took this lock. Our lockers had these combination locks like you'd have in school. Rotate twice to the right, 13. One time to the left, 27. And whatever your combination is. Ian waited till the middle of the night, probably 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning. And we used to have these brown belts that had like the little gold military buckles. Ian takes his belt, pulls the buckle off, puts the padlock on it, ties the belt in a knot, wraps it around his head, creeps over where the dude's bunk is, smacks him in his face with the padlock. That would be the point when I woke up. This is all the way in the back at this point. And all I hear this dude do is just wake up pretty much say, I'm going to kill you. What the fuck? Da, da, da. Ian pops him a second time. When he hit him the second time, it was night-night. Lights out. Knocked him out. Continued to hit him with his padlock. Continued to beat on him. Until the point that the belt and everything slung out of his hand. Guards banging on the control booth window. Other guards come running from other buildings. Whenever something like that happens, they call a code. And all available officers on that section of the compound or to report to exactly where this is going on. So by then, boom, 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 all the lights inside the dorm start coming on. The red lights are off. Now all the other lights on. We see Ian back there smacking this dude that's unconscious with his padlock tied to this belt. Boom, boom. Beating him, beating him, beating him. Ian never reported anything to these dudes about to the administration, the guards, which he wasn't supposed to. You can't do that. He never told them about the beating he took. He never told them about getting his stuff stolen. He never told them about that open hand slap he got that, you know, left him whelps on his face. So when they come in, they don't know what's going on. They're just under the assumption these two men got an issue and that the younger one is now taking it upon himself to take a weapon and beat this man while he was asleep. When I tell you he dented his head in and dented his face in with that padlock, that is an understatement. If you've ever been hit with a padlock, it will split you. I've got a split back here. I've got a split on top of my head. I've got a dent, like right, a small little dent right on top of my head. It's like a little crater where I got hit with a lock one time. That padlock will forever change your structure. It will rearrange your face. It is unforgiving. Ian beat him. I'd say he probably hit the dude eight, nine times. The first one being while the guy was asleep. The guy woke up, realized he had just been hit. Went to go go with Ian. Ian popped him a second time, knocked him out. And then, like something out of a horror movie, just continued to hit him in the face with the belt 
with his master lock on the end, continue to swing it in between the bumps, thunking him, hitting him in his face. They take Ian out. Ian's got blood on him, blood on his shirt, blood on his arms, splatter on him from where he pulled his belt back with his lock and it would sling blood on him. They take the next man. Medical comes running in. They can't move him. They have to get nurses there to see what's going on. They run in. The guy's breathing weird. His nose is broke. He's gurgling. And his face is just completely unrecognizable. He has split his cheeks to where stuff is leaned open. Has split his forehead to where it's bent in in certain spots. Crushed his eyebrow. It was just a horrendous scene. As they were lifting this man up and putting him on a stretcher. We're in a dorm. We have nowhere to go. They tell you, stay on your bunk. Stay in your bunk area. I'm standing on the bunk. And when, I, when you stand up and you're on the top bunk, you can see. It's like standing on a hilltop. You can see everything going on around you. So I'm standing on top of this bunk. Looking over at the dude. And the dude is just laying there. Limp. One arm hanging off the bed. Completely unconscious with his face caved in. They took him up out of there, med flighted him to the closest hospital. We heard the helicopter land, fly off with him. And they took Ian to the hole. Ended up hitting Ian with a whole bunch of new charges, malicious wounding, uh, assault with a deadly weapon. I would end up getting shipped off to Greensville. I don't know the outcome of what happened with Ian. I don't know the condition of the guy that they took up out of there how bad his injuries were, how long he would be in the hospital. I did not expect to see that situation play out the way it did. I never in a million years expected Ian, a.k.a. Tigger, to do something like that. But I guess he was scared, accompanied with the guys in his ears, Telling him, you're going to continue to deal with this. You got to go do time in prison. Them dudes up there are going to take things from you. Real things from you. Like your virginity. Yeah, they're going to do other things to you. When they get word that while you was here, you was getting beat up and slapped around. You need to go ahead and make a name for yourself. And that's exactly what he did. He made a name for himself. But I can promise you this. Here in the state of Virginia, when you do that to another inmate, oh, you're going to court. Not no kangaroo court that's in the prison. You're going to street court. You're going in front of a judge. And that doesn't matter what your reason for doing what it was. Because at the end of the day, you never said anything about it. It's all hearsay. For all we know, you owed that man some money for some drugs or something. They're not going to try to hear he beat me up in the past. Because at the point they come in there, Ian didn't have a single mark on him. Ian didn't have a slap mark on his face. His face wasn't beat up no more from where dude they beat him up. Ain't nobody else going to testify that Ian got beat up because you mind your own business. You better not go to court and speak up for the next man. That was a learning lesson for me. I knew way before that to never underestimate somebody, but I did not foresee that young boy doing what he did. It shocked the hell out of me. When it was all said and done, wasn't no going back to sleep. I'm sitting on top bunk like, what did I just witness? Did the little dude they called Tigger, that little dude Ian, just smash that big dude out with the lock? Like, wow. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. You just want to click your heels together like Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz and go home. But let me tell you this. Once you get behind that wall, the only thing that's going to click to get you to go home is that clock. And it's going to tick, 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 tick until the amount of time the judge told you is finally up and done. Other than that, you don't get to tell them, I didn't sign up for this, man. You know, that was crazy. I didn't expect to see that take place. I'm sorry I'd like to go home now. No, not an option. I still got to stay here for another 10 years. Damn. Damn. I wanted to get into one more story, but I just realized with the story I just told, we're already at 41 minutes. So I do have something I need to touch on that I did this past weekend with an organization out here in Richmond, Virginia that I'd like to shed light on. There's an organization called A Better Day Than Yesterday. 
This organization deals with children whose parents aren't around. Parents may be incarcerated. They may be in the military, whatever it may be. But for the most part, they deal with less fortunate children. They also deal with men that are just coming out the system or that have been out the system that are looking to become better parents, that are becoming, you know, looking to reconnect with society to be better than they were when they went in. But the main thing is the children. I reached out to Letitia. Salute to you, Letitia. And she hit me back. I've emailed her and she called me when I got off work Friday. I went out Saturday to Broad Rock Park and spent the day with ex-cons, spent the day with the kids. They barbecued, music was jumping, my homeboy Frog went with me, took my little boy, and we had a good time. I've got some things coming up that I'm going to do with A Better Day Than Yesterday to help shed light on what they have going on because it's a beautiful thing. A lot of kids, a lot of single moms or single dads need to know about this, this organization, these people. And I can help do that by spreading awareness. So this coming week, I'm going to go sit down with her and some of the other guys and founders. I'm going to do some recording strictly based around that, trying to give back to the community so that y'all can get a better feel for what some of these kids go through, what some of these men have been through since they've been home. The trials and tribulations that come with coming out of the system and trying to be a good dad. The stigma that's attached to being an ex-con and trying to be a productive member of society. I ran into guys out there that had done a lot of time. One man had a very controversial case here in Virginia. And was the reason that the whole entire parole board was recently fired. I'm not going to say his name. The man did 41 years and was released and was out there. I talked with him for a while, called up Banky and let Banky Pound talk to this man on the phone. They both knew each other. It was a great day, man. It was a good feeling. I look forward to doing more stuff with a better day than yesterday. Thank y'all for having me and shout out to all y'all. Big ups to everybody that was out there this weekend. Much love to all the children. I'll see y'all again soon. With all that being said, I have to close this video out, take this shirt off, take this hat off, put my work hat on, put my work shirt on, and get inside this house and get some work done. That is what I do. Stay out of prison, people. If you're young and you're watching this, please think before you act. There are consequences to our actions. Getting locked up might not be the worst part of what you're going to deal with. The worst part of you're going to, what you're going to deal with may come at the hands of somebody around you once you get in there. Being locked up in itself is just terrible. To be away from the ones you love in an unfamiliar environment, not able to go home, that's just all the way around the board bad. But then you take someone that's real violent and place them in a situation, you're not violent, and now you've got to deal with that man day in and day out. Your mama can't save you. Your daddy can't save you. And unless you're going to snitch, the guards can't save you. And even after you snitch, well, now you're labeled a snitch. I don't know what Ian's outcome was. I can promise you this. With Ian attacking that man like that, he 100% got more time. And instead of going to a lower level, he ended up in an environment where everybody was violent, where violence was king, where violence was a universal language. In the penitentiary, violence is the one language that everybody understands. A man cannot speak English at all, but he understands violence. This is not the life you want. These aren't the memories you want. Sure, this is entertaining, but it wasn't at the moment. I'd much rather been at home asleep. I woke up to a dog barking. Then wake up to some young boy over there beating a man with a padlock and a belt. Wake up before it's too late. And let today be a better day than yesterday. Once again, shout out to Letitia. But anyway, these jails, detention centers, these prisons, these facilities, they're all just crazier worlds inside of this already crazy world we live in. And as always, y'all know what I'm doing. I'm just trying to keep y'all entertained. Are you not entertained?
And like always, this is Jay Williams. Let's live life. And to all my real ones and the awesome real ones watching, because y'all still watching me. Man, y'all know how we do. Salute. I ain't trying to beat that dude to death. I'm so glad I'm out of prison. I get to sleep in my bed. That puppy's keeping me awake. But if that's the worst I got to deal with, you know what? Life is okay.